Hello and welcome to this Pension and Investments Q&A session. My name is Lothar Mentel. I'm the Chief Investment Officer and CEO of Tet Investment Management. In this session, I will be addressing a range of issues which reflect the mood of the typical or the potential investor during this COVID-19 pandemic. All questions have been provided and submitted by clients and associates of Colin Mordatton solicitors and I would like to thank Gareth Williams, IFA at Colin Mordatton for arranging this event. I know that Colin Mordatton was one of the first solicitors in Cheshire to combine financial advice and legal services and have been supporting clients with their financial needs for over 25 years. As you may be aware, Gareth and his financial services colleagues provide a range of independent service and advice in the areas of pensions, investments, mortgages and equity release, all with the aim of supporting you to achieve your long-term financial goals. So let's begin. The first submitted question reads, the World Health Organization declared coronavirus a pandemic on 12th of March. However, the markets had already started to preempt this around the 23rd of February. Given that there were early warning signs well before then, what lessons have been learned to spot them next time to avoid replicating the same level of losses? Well, we probably have to dis differentiate here between another um, unknown, unknown external shock type scenario and another um, COVID type um, virus shock to the global economy. Um, benefit of hindsight is a brilliant thing. Um, it isn't um, that we weren't aware of the virus and weren't discussing it since um, January. However, um, many parallels uh, were being drawn and could be drawn then to the SARS crisis of 2002-2003, which started very similarly and was well contained within Asia, never spread around the world and never had a massive impact on the global economy. And knowing and understanding that, uh, there was at that point a greater risk of missing the upswing, uh, which was very much in train since the beginning of the year uh, from global trade after the Chinese-US trade wars had at least been settled with a truce for the foreseeable future and therefore uh, staying long equities, not going overweight, um, but staying um, at a neutral weighting in accordance with the asset allocations of the risk profiles um, seemed the right thing to do. Uh, once the um, epidemic uh, risk had struck, markets were so much in a free fall that actually uh, trying to catch that falling knife uh, uh, had far more the risk of um, falling into the same trap that usually emotional investors fall into, i.e. selling once it has fallen, fallen and then uh, sitting perhaps on the sidelines and losing uh, the upswing. So that's the first thing around what how would we be prepared if one of those external uh, shocks uh, from, from a virus would happen again. And it probably also needs to be said that now that the world is a very, very uh, sensitized to, to virus and virus spreading, we can expect there to be an even bigger reaction initially and immediately if the next virus breakout um, happens, even though we know from history that these sort of really globally threatening pandemics tend to not happen that often. Indeed, the last one was the Spanish flu a good hundred years ago. The second bit is, well, how do you prepare against these external shocks, these unknown unknowns that can strike um, at any time and that aren't really um, foreseeable in uh, their effects um, when they uh, occur? And the answer to that is, that is exactly why um, we always advise and only make available well diversified global investment portfolios which are and have a uh, risk asset exposure uh, at different risk levels for whatever clients are comfortable with um, taking and accepting in return for achieving returns which are above the rate that might be achieved through bank savings or government bonds, i.e. Uh, taking risk but taking measured risks. And that is the main um, force of um, uh, support and, and um, defense that we have in portfolios, in investments against these external shocks that can happen from time to time, 
but we all, always know that um, eventually these things passed and um, have not really left a very long-lasting damage um, to the global economy and as these portfolios tend to be and have to be seen as um, a stake in the global economy, its capital and its future growth potential, the key and crucial question is, do these shocks leave a long-lasting impact on the global economy? And I'm sure over the next couple of questions we'll be discussing that a little bit more. The second question is, infection and recovery rates are improving daily but we're not out of the woods yet. What is the current strategy to reduce the impact and protect our investments until we are in a much better place? Well, the interesting thing with capital markets is that they're not necessarily always a short-term or a good short-term barometer of where the economy is going. And indeed, um, capital markets oftentimes anticipate things and have already priced in uh, what's going on in the near-term future. So um, on that basis, uh, you know, and, and, and evidence for that is that we've seen a very strong recovery in capital markets since uh, the end of March, even though that coincided with the global economy uh, really going into an absolute nosedive as it was put into that medically induced coma uh, that was prescribed by government and society at large in order to save lives. Uh, yet equity markets have risen. So that is because equity markets uh, look further ahead and um, oftentimes then disregard the things that they know will happen in the shorter term as long as they find an anchor point further in the future that they can hold on to. And that anchor point, and that is very important to recognize at the moment with this recession, is that eventually this will end either because we're getting and finding uh, more effective antiviral drugs to deal uh, with the um, biggest and, and most severe symptoms of the illness or because we're learning how to deal with it until a vaccine is becoming available. We know that that vaccine will become available either later on this year or in the worst case sometime next year. And therefore, um, global capital markets on which investments and diversified portfolios are based are uh, looking at that future point and are recognizing that compared to a real war, there is no physical destruction to the global economy, the processes, the potential, uh, but indeed um, it will still be there when we come out at the other end and should actually be able to be switched back on relatively easily as long as the governments and central banks do what they've pledged to do and so far they are, which is to get that revenue bridge that the whole economy is facing and suffering while we're going through this. The third question reads, while still an investor and continuing to invest, there's that nagging doubt that liquidating everything and holding cash would have been a solution. Would it have been the solution? Or would there be or have been other viable approaches to consider? Alternatively, is sit back and ride out the storm, the right response in this scenario? Well, I would suggest the latter is the right approach in this scenario to ride out the storm because we are in very much unprecedented time. I don't need to repeat that term yet again, really. Uh, but there is no real historical precedent except for those very long-term things that I mentioned early on that we can um, really um, um, put our um, uh, convictions on. And also historical precedents in that sense that obviously we have had global pandemics before. And the worst one, a good hundred years ago, the Spanish flu pandemic, um, the Spanish flu did really wreak havoc uh, globally with um, 50 million uh, fatalities back then, which still compares, you know, there's no comparison uh, at the moment to, to that really horrific figure. And yet, um, after that, we experienced um, the roaring 20s. So on that basis, um, you know, being in cash uh, may be quite comforting in the shorter term, but the experience is that uh, clients then usually tend to really lose the long-term investment um, and upside potential because going into cash initially is very easy, but if that came from uh, one's uh, long-term convictions being undermined, it usually takes a lot longer for the private investor to rebuild those convictions uh, than the market, and the market tend to rally away long before private investors 
come back in. So um, in, it in is empirical evidence that that is the one way and the only way that investors, long-term investors, have managed to lose value over the longer term versus their stated goal at the very beginning. The fourth question is, the word recession is being used more frequently together with government stimulus and the threat of record unemployment. Is there a cure formula ready to be adopted within the investment world to preserve and protect investment values? Well, as we discussed in the, um, uh, with the earlier question, um, the, the best um, approach at the moment is to uh, run a steady ship uh, in the investment portfolios, not to do anything too erratic, but um, gradually adjust um, the portfolio composition to the um, changing risks and opportunities that individual sectors of our industry and global economy um, are going through. Um, government stimulus is, is what we call fiscal stimulus, and that fiscal stimulus is also being supported by um, central banks making sure that um, the cost of that government investment or government debt raising remains at record uh, low levels. And uh, while that's not a cure-all formula, it is a very good way of bridging over that gap and getting uh, the economy through this without um, suffering um, any particular collateral damage or scarring, as we tend to say, tend to say in, in, in economist circles. So, um, uh, is, is there anything else we could do to preserve and protect investments? Well, the active management approach that you've chosen and that we implement is one of them. So we have been um, adjusting portfolios gradually over time and have just gone through a major rebalance where we have reordered the portfolios to make sure that they are appropriately positioned for what lies ahead and particularly uh, positioned towards those regions where we deem um, the recovery to first take hold and that has been whether we like it or not uh, in China and China has proven to be the most resilient equity market ever since this started and is still um, outperforming um, many other regions of the world. Question 5. Just because it isn't being mentioned as much in the media the end of the Brexit transition period is still looming large. Is the investment world braced for the effects of this or has it already been considered with current equity markets? Well, it may not be mentioned so much in the media anymore, but it is certainly priced into UK equity valuations, which are lower valued still than um, we see in many other regions of the world. So uh, the investment markets, the capital markets still have that in the back of their mind that there's not just the uncertainty around the timing of coming out of the COVID recession, but then that there's always or also going to be uh, that Brexit exit uh, still looming. Now, the jury is out on whether it will actually happen uh, in the current time frame. Um, and just as this um, unprecedented incident of the COVID-19 crisis has changed all other rules in the rule book, we wouldn't be surprised if it also changes slightly the Brexit rule book. And the, the government is, uh, has recently insisted that the timeframes are still the same. Uh, we're not so sure. But the one thing that we are certain about is that it has and still is um, putting a bigger uh, uncertainty factor into UK valuations and for that reason they are lower value than the rest of the world um, and might stay so for a longer time. There may be good upside potential further down the line but for the time being in the client portfolios that we run we have reduced uh, the UK exposure in favour of other regions around the world uh, which are not facing that. We would uh, still um, really advise against completely getting out of the UK because um, the UK is still very much a globally orientated um, investment market, a capital market with lots of revenues coming from elsewhere in the world and therefore uh, completely getting out of the UK and the opportunities that exist here uh, would really undermine the uh, globally diversified character that portfolios should always have. The sixth question is, within with interest rates so low and investment values looking like a bargain, when is the best time to invest in a market like this? Well, the first part of the question is, is absolutely right. Um, interest rates are very low and indeed um, yields that one could get on, on relatively safe investments like government bonds are also very low. 
Uh, unfortunately, what's not quite true and implied in the question is that um, uh, markets, equity markets, are currently a bargain. Ever since we um, have gone into this uh, bull market uh, of a recovery, could be uh, perhaps just a, a bull market um, or a bear market uh, rally, as, as we would call it, um, this has left equity markets quite highly valued because at the same time, the earnings that underpin equity markets have fallen very rapidly and the expectations for them as well. And with equity values being, uh, equity markets being valued as the ratio between the price and the expected earnings underneath, that ratio has gone up because equity markets have gone up yet um, the earnings have gone down. So uh, we're now trading at multiples um, that are higher than we have seen them and experienced them at the highest level of the markets in February when a lot of observers were nervous about the bullishness of equity investors then in light of a rebound in global trade and, and the global economy. So I'm afraid to say at the moment it looks like the equity markets have um, um, priced in more than perhaps is um, available in the shorter term, as I said, have really um, been willing to look further down the line, but that also makes them relatively nervous at the moment and susceptible to setbacks or bad news. And um, that's what we see on a continuous basis. So, um, for example, a couple of weeks ago when the oil price fell into the negative, that unsettled and rattled the markets for two days before they resumed their stability. And that means that at the moment we still have to grapple and have to expect quite a lot of volatility in the markets. And therefore, going into these markets with a big lump sum um, does bear the risk of potentially mistiming these markets in the shorter term. Therefore, my approach is always to anybody who wants to ask me uh, to go in gradually, i.e. we call this pound cost averaging, just in a staggered or drip feet approach if there is a larger sum of cash to invest. The most important thing is to get it back into investment because we know it's time in the markets rather than timing the markets, but do it gradually. Uh, split your investment pot into uh, maybe six or 12 equal parts and drip feed it in on a week by week basis. Your financial advisor uh, will be happy to help, I'm sure. Question number seven. We have seen markets fall and rise in recent years, and while there is historic evidence that financial markets do return from falls eventually, we haven't yet lived through a market so affected by a medical emergency. What evidence is there to highlight optimism for the future return in investment values, and when should we start to see markets settle? Well, as I said before, that's uh, perhaps not entirely true. We've, we've had a precedent um, to this medical crisis, except that um, the world didn't react with quite the same shutdown that we have um, gone through now, uh, namely the Spanish flu pandemic of uh, 1918 to 1920, so pretty exactly 100 years ago, actually uh, caused a higher fatality uh, around the world uh, than hopefully we will ever reach with this. Um, indeed, uh, history tells us that about 50 million uh, people worldwide um, died as a result of that uh, flu pandemic, uh, and which is obviously uh, hugely more than now. Yet we also know and remember from history books that the 1920s are also referred to as the Roaring Twenties, when really after World War I, um, a lot of economic activity returned and the global economy uh, was booming. So, um, you know, uh, in, in that sense, that, that's also the stance that capital markets have taken, that um, after epidemics, usually things do get better, as, as everybody around the world is wanting to catch up with the life that they've missed. Uh, but they're also taking heart from the fact that governments and central banks are really doing everything they can and really beyond the usual rule book in order to bridge um, us over this gap, this revenue gap that has opened up through this um, uh, government-induced coma uh, to the global economy. Um, will markets settle? Well, I think they have already settled to quite a degree with the rebound that we've seen over the course of April and now continuing into May. Um, that isn't to say that we might not see volatility again um, if markets um, experience some surprises that they hadn't quite um, thought about. There will be uh, defaults as well that can't be 
prevented and that will on a continuous basis um, rattle the markets and we will see ups and downs so I don't expect metal, uh, markets to particularly settle down but to continue to really focus on um, a point further down the line that point of certainty that we will eventually come through this crisis and in the past and in human history um, the global economy has not been majorly held back by events like these they have been short-term unpleasant and painful events but they haven't undermined uh, the economic long-term economic output and potential of the global economy uh, which um, investment portfolios constitute a stake in the eighth question is in addition to answering questions from advisors you will clearly be asking questions of the individual fund managers within your portfolios what are the three main questions you are asking and are you satisfied with the answers provided yeah, so uh, the three questions that we uh, tend to always ask, apart from other questions as well, is how the operations have coped and whether they are still operating in the way that we would expect them to operate, just as we have continued to fully be fully operational, even though we are now in a decentralized working from home type of environment. The second one is whether their general outlook with regards to their investments in their portfolio has changed. And then thirdly, how they are planning to adapt and adopt in their portfolio to the changing opportunity and risk set uh, that we are going to get uh, over the medium term from um, the going back to work a bit more slowly, the coming out and up from, from the lockdown uh, and how they might be adjusting their portfolios. I have to say we're, we're very satisfied with what we've heard. We haven't had uh, any cause to um, um, have concern with any one of our individual uh, investment managers. The industry, because of its own sort of near death experience 10 years ago uh, during the financial crisis, has been much better prepared, I would say, than much of the rest of, of, of the global business community to deal with an environment where from one day to the other we can't work from our offices anymore. So we've always had business continuity plans which were very much um, based on everybody being able to work from home and our systems uh, being more cloud-based than locally based. So we were able, just like the fund managers we cooperate with and that we work with, um, to, to operate and remain fully functional. They are very much having the conversations with the companies that they're invested in and they are taking steps to increase or reduce exposures depending on what their expectations are for the specific industries they're invested in. And they are also very much like us, um, looking at all the research available and doing a lot of thinking as to how this may change our behaviors in the medium term before we really go back to the old normal and therefore who may be the relative winners and the relative losers in this environment and that all um, feeds into our approach of um, running a steady ship of sailing the portfolios through these relatively rough seas that we're currently experiencing. Now on to the uh, ninth and last question. I have always considered myself to be quite an adventurous investor and happy to roll with the punches. But should I let current events sway my long-term convictions? Well, I would very much say do not. Um, I'm also in your camp. Um, I'm a very long-term investor and I'm also a very um, high-risk investor relatively, but that probably comes uh, with the territory. And um, the experience is now and has been um, historically and also uh, following the Spanish flu uh, epidemic um, that things do return to normal and even though in the shorter term it looks like everything will change and nothing will ever be the same again uh, I think you will recall that we had exactly those discussions also during the global financial crisis and then uh, just fairly soon thereafter it turned out that yes certain things were changing gradually but overall our world still continues roughly a similar track down the road so Yes, uh, please do not um, lose uh, heart and the insight of the benefits of long-term investment strategies. Um, it may be very rough winds at the moment. It may be very disconcerting and affecting us all very personally, but overall the world tends to change a lot less than during these particular dark times we always seem to assume uh, as that seems to be part of human nature. Thank you very much.
Thank you for taking the time to watch this Q&A session. I hope you found it useful and perhaps in uh, parts also thought provoking. Um, there were many questions submitted. We've been able to answer nine, but clearly not all of them. Um, so please feel free to contact Gareth Williams. who will be happy uh, to either channel them through to me or answer them uh, directly. You can get hold of him at Colin Dutton. Um, under the telephone number 01244356789. I repeat, 01244356789 or email at info, info at collymore.co.uk. I repeat, info at collymore.co.uk. So, this is all that remains for me and uh, thank you very much uh, for joining us. Goodbye.